poets sharing their work, you getting inspiration from other people, becoming a better poet and becoming a better person. Uni Slam is the most incredible experience I've ever taken part in. It's the biggest, warmest, most poetry filled environment. You get that same feeling of being in a festival and being surrounded by people who are like minded and you can be yourself and they will respect you and love you. Whether you fluff lines, like, it doesn't matter what happens, everyone is here to support each other and there will always be someone who loves what you've done. Even if you scrub out in the first round, you have an entire weekend of workshops, of slams, of just hanging out with poets and both professional and amateur rising stars and people who have already made their mark on the scene just need to want to do poetry. I love that they gave us a twin uni team because that made it just easier to meet people, especially like I have social anxiety so meeting a lot of new people is not really easy for me but I felt that made it easier. I think my favourite moment of this weekend was probably the workshops because they were industry, like some of the best poets in the industry, teaching amazing workshops about what it is like being a poet, things to do with publishing, editing, um, politics, how to bring you do narratives into your poetry. I've been crying, I've been laughing, I've been staring into nothingness because I didn't know how to react. There have been some amazing performances, like not just from uh, the students taking part, but the judges and the organisers. And just seeing that level of like dedication and um, passion for this art form has kind of refreshed my own as well, to be honest. I think I'm just really grateful to have been at UniSlam. I think I've learned and unlearned so many things. I've learned about other people. I've learned about other ideas. And I think I'm a much stronger poet because I went to UniSlam. So UniSlam is a coming together of the amazing academic institutions around the UK in their best and finest poets together in teams to compete. While it's a competition, that's not the main part of UniSlam. UniSlam is about a group of poets sharing their work, you getting inspiration from other people, becoming a better poet and becoming a better person. UniSlam is the most incredible experience I've ever taken part in. It's the biggest, warmest, most poetry filled environment. You get that same feeling of being in a festival and being surrounded by people who are like-minded and you can be yourself and they will respect you and love you. Whether you fluff lines, like, it doesn't matter what happens, everyone is here to support each other and there will always be someone who loves what you've done. Even if you scrub out in the first round, you have an entire weekend of workshops, of slams, of just hanging out with poets and both professional and amateur rising stars and people who have already made their mark on the scene just need to want to do poetry. I love that they gave us a twin uni team because that made it just easier to meet people, especially like I have social anxiety, so meeting a lot of new people is not really easy for me, but I felt that made it easier. I think my favourite moment of this weekend was probably the workshops because they were industry, like some of the best poets in the industry, teaching amazing workshops about what it is like being a poet, things to do with publishing, editing, um, politics, how to bring you do narratives into your poetry. I've been crying, I've been laughing, I've been staring into nothingness because I didn't know how to react. There have been some amazing performances like not just from uh, the students taking part but the judges and the organisers and just seeing that level of like dedication and um, passion for this art form has kind of refreshed my own as well to be honest. I think I'm just really grateful to have been at UniSlam. I think I've learned and unlearned so many things. I've learned about other people, I've learned about other ideas and I think I'm a much stronger poet because I went to UniSlam. So UniSlam is a coming together of the amazing academic institutions around the UK in their best and finest poets together in teams to compete. While it's a competition, that's not the main part of UniSlam. UniSlam is about a group of poets sharing their work, you getting inspiration from other people, becoming a better poet and becoming a better person. UniSlam is the most incredible experience I've ever
I let you in on a secret. It's the grand final of Uni Slam 2024. Oh, it's about to be a good night. You're all here. Look at your lovely smiling faces. We've got the the Grand Slam final teams over here, ready and waiting. You've got our amazing BSL interpreter over here. We've got our esteemed judges ready and waiting. I've got ice in my wine. What could go wrong? What could go wrong? Mm. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Whether you've been here all weekend, whether you were here just for the semifinals, whether you've just joined us now, thank all to all of you for just being part of this community, for being part of poetry, being part of this weird, wonderful, just such a, such a privilege to be part of this place and space. And yeah, it's gonna be a, a pretty packed night, so I'm not gonna go on and on, but uh, just to say that we have four teams who are going through to the finals. I've left the list over here, hold on. First up, we got Birmingham. Make some noise. We've got Royal Holloway. We've got Cambridge. And finally, we have Warwick. Usually us hosts have to do this thing where we warm you up and then we're like, oh my God, can you do a bit of applause that's like you're at a really boring cricket match? And now can you do some applause uh, like you've seen a poem that's like a 6.42 out of 10 and you're like, you're not like displeased, but also you're not especially compelled or joyous about the fact. And now can you make loads of noise? But I can tell I don't need to do that with you guys. You guys are on it. You're ready. You're pumped up. You're gassed. But... Just to make sure that we're getting the full range of noises that we can make from our bodies. Um, let us feel what it's like to make a groundswell with our feet, everybody. Just with our feet. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Exactly. Exactly. I know you young'uns like to wear like big like moon boots and shit. Moon boots and platform Nikes, put them to good use. Gorgeous, okay, all right. Let's get some just lovely sonorous clicks through the room. Mm. Beautiful, gorgeous. That can be like our little like top note. Cause you know, I drink wine with ice. <laughs> I know about top notes, okay, beautiful. So we've got the base of the feet. We've got this lovely sort of like hi-hat with the clicks, okay, and now you know, uh, any other audience who's not a professional seasoned audience like you would just do some cheers, some whoops, some, some basic bitch shit, right, basically. Now you, you understand the full range, the orchestral opportunity that lies in the noise that an audience can make. So we're not just going to do cheers and whoops, uh-uh, uh-uh. We are going to create the cacophony of a zoo when the zookeeper has left the gate open by mistake, okay? So I want to hear the, the, the bellow of a gorilla, the, the, the core of a toucan. Um, what noise does a giraffe make? I don't know. One of you's about to make it and I'm about to learn something new, okay? So I just want you to make a noise and not worry about how it sounds. I want you to just let whatever comes up through your body out of your mouth, yes? A moment of freedom, of abandon, okay? And also some cheers and whoops and everything else, but also we're just gonna add a little bit of an animalistic vibe, okay? And you have to commit, okay? Don't tense, because the people sat either side of you, they can feel your shoulders going up like, oh, but I don't wanna do it. No, this is not that time, okay? We're all in this together. And also like, this is like a closed room with no windows. Who knows what noises you made in here? I mean, they are filming all of this for posterity, but own it, commit to it, okay? So on the count of three, you're gonna make the wildest, craziest, most unhinged noise you've ever made, okay? And everybody's in it with you. Me too, okay? One, two, 
Tropicana drinks are free. Um, that was so great. That was so great. I really feel like I've got some co-conspirators in the room, which is all I could ever ask for. I'm Vanessa, by the way. Hello. 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 Hi. Um, for those not familiar with my law, I drink wine and I chat shit. Um, I'm, very, I'm very good at both. Um, I also do poems sometimes, but those, those, are the, those are the two main things. The poetry is adjacent, do you, do you see me? Okay, so we're gonna get cracking with the slam. So for those of you who don't know how a slam works, I'm gonna break it down. We are gonna have each team perform four poems and they're gonna be scored from zero to 20 by our judges based on both delivery and writing. So those are two different scores, okay? And there are a couple of rules. There are no props allowed and also no nudity. Okay, I'm not familiar with why these rules needed to be explicitly stated. You'd think that would be obvious, but I don't know, man. Use your imaginations as to what has happened in Unislam's past for that to be stated. I don't, I, don't, I don't know, I don't care to know. But no props, no nudity. So any, what they call them, them, them things in the circus that's like, and you've got it on a string and it looks like an, it looks like, a, yeah, any Diablos or like any didgeridoos or like any other mad things there, I don't know, just like quietly put them back in your tote bag. This is not the time, okay? No nipples, no, you know, sly little like peaks of crotch, okay? Even if you're getting halfway through your poem and you're like, I don't know if they're feeling it, maybe I need to take it up a notch. Don't do that, okay? Let the poem speak for itself. And you know, I know that might sound like a silly thing, these, these rules, but at the core of these rules is the fact that the poems should stand for themselves. We don't need gimmicks. We don't need other things to prop up the poem. The words are enough. Your presence is enough. Your breath in your body is enough, right? So honor that, be with that. You're all gonna do amazingly. Okay, housekeeping for everybody. Phones on silent. Phones on silent, okay? Not vibrate not really, really low, silent. You ain't that popular, okay? <laughs> it's, you don't, it's, it's not that deep. Oh my God, what will happen if people can't contact me for two hours? The world will keep spinning. Trust and believe, trust and believe. Phones on silent. And there is no fire tests planned for this evening, so if you hear the fire alarm, that does mean that we're about to become toasted marshmallows if we don't make our way swiftly out of the building, okay? So if you hear one, please do make your way out in an orderly fashion from either, I think probably this one, right? Not that one. Oh no, they're both, they're both our exits, okay? So whichever you're closest to, please make your way out quickly and efficiently. A general trigger warning for any potential themes that might come up tonight. So as I'm sure you're aware, people are writing about things that really matter to them. And sometimes that's the really hard stuff, okay? That might be violence, that might be abuse, that might be um, sexual violence, um, different prejudices, all sorts of things might come up. And we're aware that that might be tough for some of you. So please feel free to take yourself outside, take a breath, grab some water, gather yourself and come back in when you're ready. No one will judge you. Do what you gotta do to take care of yourselves. And please post about the slam online, find, a time that's not gonna disturb from the poetry on stage, but please do post online about UniSlam. Uh, it's at uni underscore slam, and that's all lowercase. So please do shout about the people you're meeting, the poetry you're seeing. Um, it's all really great to get the word out about what we're doing. Um, event is being live streamed. So where am I looking? Is this over here? So I'm just gonna wave hello. Hello audience um, at home. Uh, and I'm not sure whether this is also going to be available after the event. Um, yes, it is, amazing. So let people know that can't be here, that they can watch it at their leisure um, if they want to. All right, so I'm about to introduce the judges. All right, can I get a ooh of anticipation? <laughs> correct, correct. All right, so first up we have Nikita Gill, everybody. Make some noise. Um, Nikita Gill is an Irish Indian poet, playwright, writer, and illustrator based in South England. She has written and curated 
not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven, but eight volumes of poetry. Can I get a what? Exactly, exactly. And one thing about Nikita that I find really amazing is not only is she a prolific poet, she's so supportive of other poets. I, I follow you on Twitter and she's always posting other poems and like bigging up other poets. Like she really is like an advocate for this art form outside of her own work. So big up for Nikita Gale. Mm. Next up, we've got Caleb Femi, make some noise. First of all, Caleb Femi always be so moisturized. He always be so moisturized. <laughs> Cheeks and forehead glistening, but like not in that way where it's like, okay, like re relax with the cocoa butter in it. Like, you know, I'm not about to like shallow fry you. Do you know what I mean? It's just like a beautiful, lovely, subtle glisten. He's like, that's why they pay me the big bucks. But yeah. <laughs> I just want to say that off the top. He is also a Nigerian-British author, filmmaker, photographer, and former Young People's Laureate for London. His debut poetry collection, Poor, was awarded a Forward Prize for Poetry. He's also got an upcoming collection coming out with Fourth Estate, who are really, really amazing publishers. And it's going to be all about the joy of the shubs, the joy of the party, um, going out, getting reckless. I can't wait to read that collection. Caleb is one of our finest poets in the UK, like just by almost all measures. So please give a big round of applause for Caleb. Almost all measures. That sounded kind of shady. I didn't even mean anything by that. I just, I, I just be saying words. Um, okay. <laughs> and finally, we have John Agard. Big it up for John Agard. And uh, I don't know whether any of you had John Agard on your syllabus. Like... Legend, legendary status in the building, everyone. He is a Guyanese playwright, poet, and children's writer. Um, he lives in Britain. In 2012, he was selected for the Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry. Um, he was awarded Book Trust's Lifetime Achievement Award in November 2021. And yeah, it is... It really is something to have someone who has been in the poetry space for so long, who has been an important uh, Caribbean voice in poetry back when it was so much harder for, for poets who weren't white um, to, to be published, to be heard, to be seen. So it really is an honor to have you here with us, John. Big up John Agard one more time. And all the other judges. Okay. All right. We're nearly about to launch into the slam. But before we do, I just want to give you a little bit of a sense of what our roles are here, okay? It's important in any space to know what you're bringing to the table, okay? So the judges, okay, your job is to give your opinion, right? Unbothered by what these lot are saying, what they're doing, what they're cheering for, what they're not. Your opinion is more important than theirs, okay? You've been paid to be here. These, these lot just came in off the street. Like, <laughs> who are they? You know what I mean? Your opinion is paramount. Audience, you are the real people. You, you are the ones that are receiving the poetry, okay? They are the cold, hard face of judgment. You are the warm, appreciative interlocutors that these poets are trying to connect with. Your opinion is the only opinion that really matters, okay? So it is your job to sway the judges, to override their parochialism, their bias, their assumptions about what is good and what is not, because you are the reason that this is going to be such a good event. You're going to bring your energy, your vibes, your love, okay? Can you do that for us? All right. Poets, you're going to get up here and you're going to be present and you're going to honour the poems that you have worked so hard to do. You're going to listen and take care of and attend to each other's poems also. And you're going to have some of the best memories of your entire life, I promise you. Yeah? Sound good? All right. Amazing. So, before we launch into the slam proper, we are going to have two sacrificial poets come up 
warm up the stage, christen the room, get us all ready. And these two poets have been selected from throughout the UniSlam process. And they haven't made it to the finals, but they have been selected by judges as exceptional poets who have come up here and done pieces that really stood out. So this is a really big honor for these people to come and share their poems with us. And we're really excited to hear these pieces again. So I'm going to introduce, so just so they're both aware, it's going to be Kieran first and then Jesse. Let's just make sure they're in the room. Kieran, are you here? Yes. Jesse, are you here? Yes. Okay, excellent. First up to the mic, can we get a big whoop here? Chola, Chola? Chola? Um, that was a, a little collab between cheer and holler. Um, it's giving gruel. It's giving, okay, if I can put a mean girl reference into anything, I will. You will learn this about me. Um, ice and the wine, chat and shit, and mean girls. Those are my personality traits. Okay, cheers, whoops, hollers, ground swells, giraffe noises for Kieran from Edge Hill. An ode to northern women. We would take Big Ev fish and chips, sit in her doily fringed living room and listen to her talk through mouthfuls of battered cod and loose false teeth about days working at the co-op. Oh, have I ever told you about that time I found a little mouse in a big bag of flour? <laughs> she had a rainbow feather duster, an old toilet with a chain you pulled to flush it and stories that would last until the chippy tea went cold. She left us with those stories and the licorice all sort jar she used to keep her porridge oats in. <laughs> Lynn would teach us how to tie dye shirts on the patios of Mediterranean villas. We would say, Grandma, we're gonna do one with a penis on it, that all right? <laughs> and she'd smile a cheeky smirk and turn her back while we twisted rubber bands into Primark t-shirts. She once choked on an aniseed twist at the dinner table. We'd eaten tart tatan and lamb pure chaos unfolded. Choking, spluttering, gasping, my granddad going, just spit it out, Lynn, please spit it out. She coughed it into his outstretched hanky and proved she could still breathe with a, <gasps> I'm fine. <laughs> As a kid, Nana Pam would pretend to be the chauffeur to my pencil cigarette holding Cruella, wrapped in a blanket as a fur coat sticking a leg out of a pretend car door. She'd knit me costumes for musical performances in the living room and taught me old handwritten recipes for cakes and pastry and biscuits. I would spray batter up the cupboard doors and when I'd say Jesus Christ, I'd get a clip and a scold. Don't bloody blaspheme, she says. <laughs> she taught me so well I can only bake in ounces. Now she just sits back and watches while I whiz between fridge and whisk and cupboard. Oh, you'll make a talented housewife one day, she says. <laughs> there aren't many specific stories I can tell about my mum, but Davina is the funniest person I have ever met. Davina is the scariest person I have ever met. <laughs> she is formidable and uses the word splificate on a daily basis. <laughs> when I go home, she stands in the kitchen waiting for supermarket deliveries and we put the world to rights. We bitch and bitch, and bitch, but we call them updates, so it makes it okay. <laughs> Any updates? Well, such and such, can't fucking stand them at the minute, so and so being a right dick. <laughs> when Proud Mary comes on in the vicinity of Davina, regardless of the function or venue, she will step and spin and swing. It is the one thing most of my friends remember about her. us dancing in a Tina Turner frenzy at my 21st. I grew up in a band of women with strong accents and strong laughs shaping me like clay on a wheel. They taught me to be unapologetic. They teach me to be funny. I will never be able to tell them how much they made me who I am, how much I admire them. So instead, we'll just exchange stories and jokes at Christmas and birthdays, cackling and drinking and loving, surrounded by matriarchs with Northern accents. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kieran. And next up, make loads of noise, give loads of love for Jesse from Oxford. This is for every teacher and every lecturer that's ever taken the time. 
I was not, not aware, not awake, half dreaming. I was a mistake. Checkmate, straight in with the pawn, Queen's Gambit. I paint like Picasso, but I'll die like Hamlet. To be or not to be, it's never not been the question. To speak or not to speak, to make it worse or make an impression, I was not. Not quick enough to learn or slow enough not to. I was not on time, not on the page that everyone else had got to. I was not, not sitting still or meeting the standards they expected. I was an error carried forward, spelling the beg to be corrected. I was not talking the right language, wasn't focused, wasn't present. But I can understand the teacher, just can't get my head around the lesson. I know Miss fights with her husband. I know Sir's always behind me. I know Miss Finch will pull up and drive me to school when my stalker's trying to find me. I know my science book looks empty, but my head's full like a sentence. If my tongue's in my cheek, I'm just reaching to speak with the comedy of adolescence. I was not shoplifting pick and mix. My pockets just taste sugary. Well, if you want me out your sight, then maybe just don't look at me. If you treat me like you're training me, don't be surprised when I'm not on track. If you talk to me over your shoulder, miss, then it's you that's talking back. I must look like a zebra crossing, cause someone's always walking over me. My heart is buried, Percy Shelley. Resting bish face, better poetry. They don't ask about your anger, they just say that it's defiance. They don't say they think you're stupid, just that it's not rocket science. A great Ormond Street psychiatrist saw me just as I turned 18. They were right, it wasn't rocket science, just ADHD. Not the kind that's fun to have and not the kind I can call a gift. Not the kind that makes you quirky, just the one that cuts you adrift. By the time I was diagnosed, it was, like me, too late for school. But when I'm one-to-one -one with words, this obstacle becomes a tool. I connect the dots like an AI bot writing up an essay plan. Because there's a lot of things I cannot do, but this is one that I can. Writing is a weapon, my tongue is a taser. Chekhov's gun meets Occam's razor. Tight like a contract, sign it like a waiver. Tie it with a knot and open it later. If you mark me down like a board, I'll write you up like Matilda's chalk. I run my mouth like it's Forrest Gump. A mile a minute when I talk. I'll sweet talk you like a witch's house. I've got a bone to pick, like Hansel. And if you're talking shit about me, like my A-levels, you'll get cancelled. <laughs> I wrote my way out like Hamilton. I'm not throwing away my shot. If I talk too fast or loud, it's cause my voice is all I've got. So no more fight or flight. These days I write, I'm writing everything I can. I'm not what they said I'm not. I'm what I say I am. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. I can think of no better energy to start this slam with than what we've just experienced from those two poets. Thank you so very much. All right, are you ready for the slam? Yeah. I said, are you ready for the slam? Yeah. I think you're ready for the slam. Okay, so team one, Birmingham. Are you ready? Yes. All right, Birmingham. Give them some love, everyone. It's opposite day! I, as a child, scream, now a man, the opposite of a child, because it's opposite day. We're in the car, going backwards down the motorway, which is a country lane, which is a bale of hay made of horses' teeth, because it's opposite day. An ambulance, I mean a hearse, crashes into the back of us. Fragments of twisted metal pierce my stomach, which is to say they emanate from me like a corrugated tutu. And I am the ballerina of opposite day. It's opposite, opposite day! My sister, previously my brother, tells me. Everybody knows you can't on opposite, opposite day. It's just a wave you have to ride, which of course means drowning. Still, for her, we'll play along. I'm so glad it's no longer opposite day. Driving on the sky was fun, but I can't help thinking about all those seagulls we ran over. 
Don't our parents look nice and right back in their genders? <laughs> Snug to their smooth or hard skin. Dad is driving, driving cords of thick hair out of his forearms, sucking on his mustache like an affirmation. He lifts up a hand to scratch at the hard node between his eyes for opening cans. I like that I come from a normal family. I asked mom for a chocolate digestive. She says, in a minute, love, because she is rolling around in the footwell of the passenger seat with the ancient water bottles. She is a smooth, hairless orb. She doesn't need a seatbelt because she is so soft and so loving and loves even the tarmac moving at 80 miles an hour underneath us like a liquid blade. In the nuclear fusion reactor of her heart, she is forming a chocolate digestive for me, which she pushes to the surface of her skin where it bobs like a paper ship. This is all what I don't see because it's opposite day. It's opposite day and we turn the car radio on. They're talking about the war. Men with hoovers which look like guns say they've been cleaning up Western imperialism, pulling the bullets out of the heads of civilians. Dad gently changes the station. It's the forecast. Apparently the climate's cooling and there's nothing to worry about. I saw something so great this opposite day. I wish my brother, sister, could have seen it too. Dad, his top half out the skylight in a white wedding dress with a train a mile long. The road turned canal, turned river, turned ocean, and his wings opened up behind us like a swan skyscraper taking flight. I hate hosting. I just want to sit there in awe. With the rest of you, I forgot to even get up here and do my job. Anyway, team two, Ro Holloway, you ready? Yeah! All right, give it up for Ro Holloway. Yeah. Content warning for this piece. This poem is about grief and loss. When I die, I hope it feels like you've come to pick me up from work again. Your flat white is steaming on the counter and we're laughing, counting change and I will ask you where you've parked the car. Can we drive down the street with the cat in the window on the way home? Will there be blue slush slowly sweating in the cup holder Chemicals sweet and bright as the day I opened my eyes. Dad, can we stop on the way home? Will you buy me a can of Coke? I imagine you're here in my bug bites, in the snails I move onto the side of the path. I imagine you as the lamb slipping from the bleating, you steaming in the fields in April. When I die, I want to come right back down again, firing like a comet straight into the first breath of a solid black kitten, too weak to fight its three siblings for milk. I want to open my eyes as an owl chick, my stubby wings unable to lift my fat little body out of the nest. One day I hope I'm a lamb, shivering in the grass in May. And after all these incarnations, I hope you'll be my father again still guarding me from the carrion birds, still licking me clean. Cambridge, you ready? Yeah? Give it up for Cambridge! Arriving early to this garden, Cambridge. Alone, the cold, its heating melted all sense that sun should light my day, I wished for dark. When sun should rise from bed, I did so too, not long before 
others would grow here too. Their petals brighter, their roots are wrung, were wrung from generations. My mother watered me with her tears. But I was darker and different so that I might absorb the most light. Let's call this garden what it is, a graveyard, a place where thinkers come to be born and then die. Their corpses creeping to capture the minds of young, I tread their graves, absorb their facts. The sun should feed me the rest, but I'm shaded, left jaded by the leaves above, fractals that paint on pistols, still the light that is free, that'll never be mine, look around. It shone so brightly on them, it shines so brightly on them, I feel blinded by the past. White colleges, white men stain my eyes. I grow weary of finding beauty in brick, that every day the sun should rise and I should let light kiss the sun-stained windows that paint my eyes with awe. This town with bell sounds on the hour and on the hearth is littered with the bones and the souls of those that I'll never know. Those that build this three-story city as it grows from a grave of violence. Am I selfish for feeling betrayed that this opportunity is stolen so much from me? Bestowed me with the bitter warmth of a secure future. Tell me again when I should look up to hope I forgot to plant its seed. Instead, something painful grows of every step that I take through these hallowed halls. But the one thing that disturbs me the most about this place is how the portraits turn to us and look in a light that they weren't made for. An old man, name unknown, maintaining eye contact with me so stoically. A lady boasting her strength with posture and instrument, but forever bound to him with power and paintbrush, who I presume painted her. Another man whose name I remember I don't know. A gong is struck. Latin is chanted to remind me that I'm here, that the history of this place overflows, that I should be grateful because I say grace in a language that sits on my tongue like the reds and the whites that they prop before me, amen, I say, as rich men and a master sit at the end of the table of tables, gaze forever transfixed onto us like we are his own. For we are his own. Let us be reminded of his children and their children and their children that grow to be seen in buildings so beautiful the atrocities behind them remain buried before us at the end of our meal. As Candles begin to go out, LEDs grow bright into a brutalism that infects a step away from him and I smile, knowing that it is us who shall cast a light on his gaze. Warwick, you ready? All right, give it up for Warwick, everybody! Hi, I'm the heart, and the reason for all you are. The passion in your poetry, the rhythm that gives you life, I give meaning. I give love and warm hugs and cozy blankets and dance in the rain. That scene, my friend, requires the activation of 600 muscles all moving in tandem from different muscle groups throughout the body. In addition, the sensation of wetness occurs when the nerve endings in the skin send signals to the brain, which then interpret that information as the feeling of rain. Word. Greetings. You may know me as the head, or the medulla oblongata, or the upstairs neighbor. I am the rope behind the curtains, the smoke and mag mirror to your magics, the paint by numbers to your passion, the instructor to your soul. I am the mind. No one cares. The brain and the mind <laughs> will be. Christ, you are what you are because I've allowed you to Allow be. me to be? Yes. Brain, you have some audacity. <laughs> the heart beats 100,000 times a day. This fist-sized organ is the organ that plays the soundtrack to your life. The scientists say that the heart is the hardest working organ in the body, which is to say that I will never leave you. When the brain is afraid and tells you to fight or take flight, I will never leave you. Instead, I will quicken. I will thump, thump, thump my way into your darkest moments, hold you tight, squeeze you safe, and call it an adrenaline rush. I will never leave. Never leave? Never? There are 
miles of blood vessels in the body and yet the heart will still try to convince you that all roads lead to that one person who doesn't even know your middle name. <laughs> heart, what do you know about fight or flight when you carry yourself tentative? So what? When you dump, dump, dump your 100,000 at the very potential of heartbreak or, or heartache, why don't you calm down for your heart's sake? In fact, let me let you take a breath. I don't need breath, I need love. I need a lifetime of moments, peace. peace of mind to set your heart I need you to see that, yes, without me, there is no heartbreak or heartache, but there is beauty. There is brain. Da Vinci is nothing more than a mere scientist. Without me, Michelangelo's name never crosses your lips. There is no joy to be found in a baby's laugh. No passion present when two pleasure-filled lovers press bodies against one another. Your heart is your why. You it's the access of love, of pain, of movie. everything that makes you you. Without me, your brain would have nowhere to take you. Soon has been asking about us, and I am starting to run out of excuses to give. <laughs> you see, the brain detects pain in all the different parts of the body, but has no pain receptors of its own. So what do you know about cleaning up other people's mess? What do you know about stitching together a dissected heart that collects bullet holes like birthday cards? A heart that volunteers itself as Cupid's punching bag every other weekend? What do you know about picking out police tape from tangled rib bones surrounding a heart that looks more crime scene than organ? Heart, I have no place to take you if you are already flirting with an early grave. All that glitter is not gold. All right, one round down, another round to go. Birmingham, are you ready? Yeah, yeah give it up for Birmingham!
But I've seen an old man decline, he decayed, turned into dust the same way he was made, same way I was raised. British nationality burnt by Yoruba flames. I've seen disease turn a man hollow. Infectious grief. I mourn the man. Knows him. Prayer did. Terminal, palliative, prayer. All right, Royal Holloway, you ready? Yeah. Give it up for Royal Holloway. Um, content warnings for mentions of fascism, allusions to death, grief, and immigrant guilt. Because you don't know, or porque no sabes, because you don't know about pigeons and how we taught them to love us just so we could turn our backs on them, <laughs> how we love to do that to each other. And you don't know that to be smitten is to be struck with devastation, to turn to salt and dissolve in their stomach, to be the bile creeping up their throat, You keep your cigarette box with a tin and a single match. And mum was the first of us to go to secondary school. So I keep our childhood in my breast pocket. And I wish I had something soft for you, not just frozen sand, but I can't help putting souls in shells scattered over a pumpkin patch. Jack-o'-lantern entrails, cake with mud, and stuck to my feet. Do you know the old woman sitting on a chair outside her house? I do. I remember. I am five, and on her lap, playing with the rings on her freckled hands, and we know there is food on the dinner table and pockets full of caramelos. I'm sorry you never learned to read your own language. And I'm sorry they only know how to make alphabet books out of regiments. And I'm happy you survived, but I'm sorry for what comes after. Papa, Mama, Nico, Miguel, Dexter, lo siento por irme. Abuela, close to the hill, there is a house where we found ourselves again childlike and invincible. Thank you. Right, Cambridge, you ready? Yeah. Give it up for Cambridge, everyone. That's the noise. I gave you my birthmark, and I led us through forests, down riverbanks, and we waded knee deep into waters for what I can only describe as our childhood. What we were by the river was ours alone, our cheeks in the water, our mouths in the water, our noses. We tried to skim stones. You tried to teach me how to float. I got this sort of sinking feeling as I fucked up both. <laughs> I'm um, giving up most days. Here, but also not of late, I cannot take the current, I cannot swirl it around my mouth and spit. Sometimes I get frantic. 
I see you by the river's edge, and all you are is water, and all I am is water, and I can't save us, and the river's only ankle deep at its shallowest, but I'm convinced that you are drowning. You can drown in any water body. So don't let it be a puddle or the bathtub. When I told you, just before diving into the tallest ocean wave we'd ever seen, I said there's this choice we make in water, holding breath or breathing in. And you stood still for what I can only describe as our childhood, hoping to God that I would learn to live on land. On the way home, you went quiet. Locked away inside your body, breathing in, B, breathing out, gone. Trying to get rid of me in the silence, trying to get rid of yourself. Erasing us, erasing the road, erasing these trees that are erasing themselves, standing there like matchsticks. God, open your mouth and talk with me about how these woods are no longer cosmically green. God, open your mouth and bite down into the edible water body of winter rivers. God, tell me anything and I'll believe it. Tell me how much love we need to feel to turn invisible. Give me any ordinary talk and I'll never be sorry again. And then you said very calmly, do you ever feel about all this, life, I mean, that it's ever so slightly impatient? And perhaps it's that you lead a quiet life. Perhaps it's that I've seen your brain leak thoughtless through the nose. But when I look at the sun, all I am is light. When I looked at the mountains, I saw only jagged. When I looked at the dead silver forest, all I saw was alive. All I could say was look. All I saw was bodies in mist, ever astounded to no ghosts. All I touched was the rough of my elbow. All I have left to give was... The river freezes in an instant. And sometimes I'm not frantic. I am giving us this moment by the river's edge that now that I am grown, I know is only a stream. Some trickling thing, I am feeding little rocks and stones. Yes, I am giving it what I cannot give myself. Something small enough to say I love you without me saying anything. All right, this is going to be the last poem of this first half from the Slam team. So, Warwick, are you ready? Yeah, let's give it up for Warwick! Addition and subtraction. She's got tradition with detachment. See, his decisions had her crashing and their visions had them clashing. Got her staring through a shattered lens. A kaleidoscope. They say thoughts never end when your life's afloat. And her love was a form of worship. See, he used to be her idol. Now her lens was tinted pink with hearts imprinted in her eyeballs. She had a veil over her eyes, but she had wanted one that's bridal. You see, it's funny how love is vital, but her heart had pierced her vitals. And now life was pouring out of her because she had poured love into him. Thought their time would last forever, but this fling was interim. And she was way too into him. And they were quick like interludes. And she couldn't make things work, so she's trying to find her place like interviews. Pause. Let me just find my thoughts. Why is life so complicated? Why do we try at all? Tell me why do good things get confiscated? Why is love at war? Why has he got her contemplating everything and more? That's addition and subtraction. He's got tradition with detachment. See, her decisions had them crashing and their visions had them clashing, got him staring through a shattered lens. A kaleidoscope. They say thoughts never end when your life's afloat. Whoa. Same time, he's six feet under. He's been stopping eating because he doesn't feel the hunger. Numb to pain beneath water and he's drowning in the deep because losing someone's daughter has him losing all his sleep. 
See, it's ironic. He was kept awake by women of his dreams, turned his days into a nightmare. And now his seconds feel just like years, distance seem like light years, swallowed by the darkness, he can't see that there's still light here. Scared of his own shadow. Trust issues not having paro, and he knows that love can hurt because he bled from Cupid's arrow. He's had enough of feeling stupid, now he's loading up his ammo. He helps Cupid catch his strays, but he's just shooting at the world. Now his head is in the world, knows the blame is on himself. He thought life was like a movie, but he didn't get to go. So if he can't have his lover, then he gets everyone's an enemy. Last one had him drained, so who else deserves all his energy? See, he doesn't want to see the light again. Because love requires effort, and he doesn't want to fight again. He'd rather bury treasure. See, he'd rather hide from paradise. Simping has him paralyzed. Now he wants a refund because love was not as advertised. <laughs> but that's addition and subtraction. They've got tradition with detachment. Their decisions had them crashing, and their visions had them clashing. Got them staring through a shattered lens, a kaleidoscope. They say thoughts never end when your life's afloat. Thank you. That was Warwick, everyone. Can I please get another huge applause, cheer, groundswell for all of the teams thus far, all the amazing poems. Coming in hot, coming in hot, keep that up. Um, so we are going to take a break after this first feature poet, one of our judges. So first up, we are gonna have Caleb Femi make some noise. Okay. Wait, 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 sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. I need to gas you up first, I need to gas you up first. Aren't you aware, Caleb, that there is an abysmal rendition of your poem community on YouTube by a Dutch man. Are you aware of that? Let me, let me tell you a story, let me tell you a story, okay. So, <laughs> this is actually so funny. Um, I meant it when I said I was a Caleb Femi stan. I'm a big, big fan of his work. And there's a poem of his called Community in the Collection Pour that I have taught a few times. And I wanted to find a reading of it, ideally by him. So I, I, I YouTube the title and I find this white Dutch guy doing the poem. Nothing wrong with that in theory, but let me tell you a bit more about the poem and you'll, you'll, you'll see why this is an issue. So um, it's this really uh, dynamic uh, poem in vernacular, it's conversational. Um, what you'll soon find out when you see him read, his, his work is, is really cinematic. It's, it's strong, it's full of character, it's very specific to his community and his ends. So this poem starts with the line, I think like, who's fucking chatting shit, right? Something like that. I'll bang your head on the concrete, like, you know, like, what ends you from? Like, that's, that's the, the vibe of the poem, okay? So this white Dutch man <laughs> um, is, is, is reading this, but bless him, he, 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 he did the best he could. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I don't know how familiar he is with, with Peckham um, <laughs> and the particularities of how people speak in Peckham and specifically black people in Peckham, but you know, our, our guy gave it a go, but, um, <laughs> It was, it was bad. It was bad. It's funny. Have you seen this? <laughs> He's like saying, that's my, that's my, that's my friend. Don't cover him. No. Um, I say that to say that Caleb's poetry is such a specific voice. It's, it's, it's got such a specific cadence to it. Uh, to me, you can tell that he is a filmmaker and a photographer because he really thinks in images. His, his work is so vivid. Um, he really thinks about what it means to write work that feels conversational, that doesn't rob you of an unusual image, a startling image, something that makes you look at the supposedly familiar in a different way. And yeah, I, I think he's someone who was offering something that nobody else in the poetry space was before he came along. And I'm very grateful to you for it. So yeah, here he is to do hopefully a better job than that Dutch guy on YouTube. <laughs> Caleb Femi, everyone. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, so I'm here to very much disappoint you. Uh, I'm not gonna do better than that. Uh, so it's, it's a joy to be here because of so many reasons. One being that to see 
Toby and the rest of the, the fantastic Unislam team build uh, an institution like this is, is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly beautiful to see. Um, poetry is one of the one of the art forms that a lot of the time we are in the marginalia. Is that you know the word I'm trying to say? Um, and often we always think about who is going to keep pushing and building and taking things on. We were all kind of slamming together many, many years ago, and it's just it's just incredible to to see um, the infrastructure and wonderful sort of community that this is. Um, so, and this book is very much connected to. Unislam, so the two poems I'm going to read today were written, I was here in 2018 actually, I said I wasn't, but I was here in 2018, in Leicester and 2019 as well. And these two poems were written on the way home after just being inspired um, by everyone. Gentle youth. If revenge was what the youths wanted, not one brick would still sit on this city skyline. We're over such theatrics for the time being. We browse through the catalogue of anarchy, underline moments in history and conclude that everyone just wants to go home. Who would have thought the streets be so frail to fall apart this easily? Utes run in all directions like scared cattle, frightened animals that are most dangerous to others and themselves. That's just basic zoology. The youths of today are cherry stems loaded in a magazine of a gun. The news, they say different. They say us youths will come for you in a smaller than night. What we're actually doing is tweeting, gramming, making music, unwrinkling nightlight from skin. One of us saw visions of a new, new home, new world, new sky, so blue it's black too. We're all sat around listening to him in tears. Utes, robbed of youth, robbed of a rocking cradle, singing the ballad of the youthful. If sorrow must come and find us, let it find us in our homes. Um, also, like, a slam, uh, I didn't get it at the time. It's only after years and years and years that I realized that a slam really the best of slams also i think this is the best slam i've ever been to but a, a slam it is like a, a mu amusement park like it should have so many varieties of rides to to enjoy it should have some rides should evoke anxiety i mean mostly for you lot um, <laughs> um but it should offer something but at the at the base the spine of it should be fun and it seems like there is a genuine understanding and culture that at the at the end of the day, like let's leave feeling like we've all had the warmest of hugs. Trauma's a warm bath. Just ask the boy who carries anger on his shoulders like two cannons. Blastoise bold. Harden like old eyes that know how wasteful it is to cry in a drought. Who took another boy's life at a funeral? Often he would tell the shiny version to a girl who cornrowed his hair on her living room floor. She would hear of how he pulled the trigger easy, like a bathroom light switch. She knew there was too much fear in his voice. Decided to run him a bath and told him, when you can no longer shrug that day away, the bosom of a warm bath will see you through. Just asked the paramedic at the scene. He knew the body was shoebox empty, but all his training didn't tell him what to do when a boy gets shot at a funeral and the crowd are unwilling to ration bowed heads between two dead bodies. How bizarre it is to give CPR to a vacant body for 30 minutes, his sorriest apology. Just ask the mother who worked until her hands curled like bald crabs to have a son on safer shores, fed him, bought him toothpaste for two decades almost. Who would get a call to say that she birthed her son into a casket after all. 
Just ask the boy writing this poem who feels like death is a party all his friends were invited to but him, who scribbles the name of his dead friend on paper. He thinks the paper is a Ouija board. He, he thinks a poetry reading is a seance. What a farce, expecting the dead to speak in the voice of a living. Thank you. What did I fucking tell you? What did I tell you? What did I tell you? What did I tell you? Was I wrong? Was I wrong? I was right. I was right. Um, thank you so much, Caleb. Um, okay, we've got about 10 minutes for the interval, so I don't want to cut into that too much. 10 minutes, do your thing, go to the toilet, get a drink, say hi to the poets, give each other compliments on your outfits, your poems, your general vibes. We will see you back here in 10 minutes. What time is it now? 39 minutes, 49 minutes past, you are back in here, bums on seats, ready to go for the second half. Thank you, everyone.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Unistar Grand Finals. Did you have a nice time? Did you make a friend? Are you all friends now? Yeah, I love that. I love that. Honestly, I, I can't stress this enough. The poetry is important, the reason why we're all here, but it's the pals you make, or even the enemies. <laughs> we all need some enemies just to keep things spicy, you know what I mean? So do what you gotta do, but like it's the connections. Like these are the things that are really gonna last months, years, a lifetime. So yeah, please make sure to, to talk to people. And I know it can be intimidating, particularly if someone's just wowed you with their poem. You're like, oh, I cannot talk to them, that's so cool. Um, but rest assured, like everybody wants to be spoken to, to, to connect on a human level. So yeah, make those friends. If you didn't in the interval, do it afterwards. All right, so I'm gonna give some thanks to the Hippodrome before we proceed. Yes. Um, I think this is one of the, the, the biggest shames of the performance space is that the person that has the microphone and the spotlight is the easy person to adulate and admire because they're very visible. Um, and they're attention halls, which is why they're up there. <laughs> cool coming from inside the house. Um, but we would not have the place and space to perform if it weren't for the people that run the tech. The people that agree to have us in the building, that facilitate this space for us. The people that are filming, the people that are interpreting, the people that put out the chairs, that, that direct you into the space and tell you which room to be in. Like all of these people make up this event and make sure it runs smoothly. And I want you to give the biggest round of applause and love for them now. The tech team especially, because they are spinning a lot of plates. This is a very intricate setup here and it runs pretty much flawlessly every year. So like really well and truly tech team, big up. Really, really good. Um, yeah, and there'll be more thanks um, at the end of the show because there's still loads of other people that need their shine. But we are gonna launch straight into the second feature poet of the evening, who is the one, the only, Nikita Gill, make some noise. Okay. <laughs> I thought how things worked around here was clear. <laughs> these, people, these, people don't, these people don't want to be gassed. It's very British, it's very British of us. Who, me? I am but a troll under a bridge. No, no, no. You will receive my excessive praise and compliments. So Nikita Gill, I just found this gorgeous quote from her online that made me really happy because it, it speaks to everything that resonates for me as a woman on this planet. There is nothing more dangerous than a girl who is aware of the flames inside her and all the damage she can do. And you know what, I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm on my Riot Girl shit, I'm on my Thelma and Louise shit, you know. Um, yeah, I wanna like, smear menstrual blood all over the walls and like yell, do you know what I mean? Like wave my arms in the air like Kate Bush and tell everybody to go fuck themselves. So that quote spoke to me. And what I love is when you, when you, when you talk to Nikita, she's so sweet, so warm, so unassuming, but her poetry really reflects all the, the multiplicity of not just being a woman, but like a person, right? Um, not only that warmth, that kindness, but also that rage, the sadness, the fear, the uncertainty. And she's unafraid to speak to hope, you know? And hope is unfashionable. The people don't wanna hope these days. I don't know what it is, but she's always giving you something to, to, to lift yourself up, to feel like there is something on the other side of tomorrow. And I think that's really important, particularly with what we're going through right now. You know, there's been amazing poems on this stage about the genocide in Gaza, all of the crazy shit that's going on right now. And we need some resilience. We need some get up and fucking go, no matter how tired and, and, and disconcerted and uh, knocked back we get, right? And I really feel like your poetry is that. It really gives some, gives some gravitas to hope. And I, I really love that. I really, really love that and appreciate that about you. And also the hair. Can we get, can we, can we get, into, can we get into it? Inches, inches and inches and inches, okay? I'm, you know, if I, if I, if I were a, a Machiavellian type, I would, I would come up behind you with the clippers and like, <laughs> and, then, and then cut frame to me, just like. <laughs> 
She's going, I need something, but I, I won't do that because um, that would be insane. <laughs> but your hair is gorgeous. Your poetry is beautiful. Please come up and bless us with your words. Nikita Gill. Can I take you everywhere with me? Like, just everywhere. <laughs> um, oh, you've said all this beautiful stuff about hope, and I only have one hopeful poem out of the three. It'll be at the end. <laughs> um, but yes, I'm here to bring the vibe down, sadly. Um, <laughs> I just want to say, like, all of you have blown me away. I just, I can't wait for the second half. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Like, the next generation is killing it, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, all right, so this poem is from, <laughs> uh, it's from, it was supposed to be a chapbook. It's ended up becoming a lot, it's like very thick now. I started writing it in my like 20s, early 20s. And it's basically a chapbook which is called, or not a chapbook, a folder which is called, Men Say Things to Me and Then I Have an Existential Crisis. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, a man tells me I have the single trait required to be a good mother. I know how to give until I am empty. And by this, he meant I am very good at breaking my soul into pieces for everyone I love. And I am good and quiet at being taken for granted. Can you blame me? I come from a legacy of women who were raised to be useful rather than joyful. Once upon a time, even my grandmother was just a little girl. She loved flowers and had a laugh like a cascading waterfall. That was before she was made to carry the weight of a crumbling family upon her back. How can I look at the skies with hope and think that I would not have to carry them too? Every woman I have ever loved has been Atlas holding the heavens on her shoulders, giving and giving until she too is devoured. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so content warning on the next one. Um, this, uh, I, I wrote this after a really close, well, he was my first love. Um, he committed suicide when I was very young. Um, so content warning. Um, it is about the effects of patriarchy on men and the witnessing from the women who loved them. This is called Everything I Never Asked Him. How often do you tell your mother that you love her? How often has your father held you and let you cry? Did you ever love a soul you always knew would never love you back? Did you ever love a man fiercely enough to hold him close yet not name him brother? Can you speak of the first girl who broke your heart without calling her something cruel too? Can your heart ever heal from all the things you will never tell me were done to you? Is there a worship inside you that calls to a forgotten forgiveness in you? Is there a sacred you wish someone else understood a sweeter language you wish others knew too? Have your fingers known fists before they have known the easiness of open hands? Has your skin known bruises before it has known the tenderness of touch? What would you be the God of? What would you be the God of? If they made you a God of soft things, would you finally learn gentle in ways it was withheld from you? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so my final poem is really, really, really short. And um, it's actually a poem I wrote when I was 18 years old. And it's done amazing things, this poem, because when I posted it online a few years later, it went around the world, and I've seen it in all sorts of strange places. But the minute I knew I had made it was when I saw it on the wall of a public toilet. <laughs> That's how you know <laughs> you've succeeded as a poet when you see it in a public toilet, right? So 
This one is called 93% stardust. We have calcium in our bones, iron in our veins, carbon in our souls, and nitrogen in our brains. 93% stardust with souls made of flames. We are all just stars that have people names. <laughs> Thank you. The radiant Nikita Gill. One more round of applause, please. I am so sorry for threatening to shave off your hair. Why did I do that? Why can't I compliment people in a normal, socially sanctioned way? Oh my God, such a loser. Okay, moving on. Anyway, it's fine. Everything's fine. Are we ready, poets? Yeah? Last hurdle. Yeah, okay, let's, let's breathe in and out together one time, yeah? Okay, after three. One, two, three. And out. Yeah? All right, let's do it. Birmingham, you ready? Yeah. All right, give it up for Birmingham! I could get up, walk over, climb out of that classroom window. I could stand in the sea at night, breathe in the snap morph of air, tearing artificial June to real November. Sway there and netted hummingbird myself for a few coldnesses. Attach myself to that sun pale tree and its peeling paper soft curves. I could emerge from the imitation sky on my hands and knees. I could become a luminescent tree thing. Feel the alkaline wind and the melodrama of distant beach town phosphorescence upon my naked chest. Hold up my bark mark palms and declare the existence of my pipshine belly button. Wrap swathes of fermented August kelp into my saturated hair. Place a large cold vein leaf upon the cracked red milk skin of my inner elbow. I could curve my elbow the wrong way, press salt dead oreed and caragreen to my back. I could hurl my phone down through the capillary oaks, follow that up by screaming. I could lie on my side upon the many stones and let them press moon dents into my hips. Lock eyes with the many eyes. Throw a tear of shell into the shallow pails and speak in a language that could be Amantu parolcio. I could take the sweet out of my pocket, lick off the blister sugar coating. I could get up, run the length of wet sand. I could shake the branch. Throw slick scraps of rust green and ochre at passing seagulls. Scream into air pools of vertigo, my mauve soft scream of tree thingness. Let my feet sink and flick, sink and flick among the lugworms. I could stay there, planet real, until I decide to come down. I could laugh in ice-bloomed pebble rejuvenation at the emergence of nipple to dark summer air. I could. I could, so why, why not? not? I, could. I could. Why, why not? not? My knuckles twitch like purple leaf lettuces. Minutes bruise up. I am the most unexpected phenomenon. My knuckles twitch like, like purple, purple leaf, leaf lettuces. lettuces. Minutes bruise up from within light particles. I, I do, do not, not understand. understand. My like knuckles, purple leaf purple lettuces, leaf like my twitch knuckles twitch. twitch. Minutes, minutes bruise like up minutes from within light particles. Up. From like within purple light leaf particles, lettuces, my knuckles twitch. Up. Bruise up. Leaf. Twitch. Knuckles, knuckles, knuckles. My, my knuckles, knuckles twitch, twitch like from within light particles. Lettuces. From within light particles, particles, minutes bruise up. I am unexpected. I do not understand. Thank you, Birmingham. Royal Holloway, are you ready? Give it up for Royal Holloway!
uh, content warning for allusions to what's going on in the Middle East at the moment. Uh, yeah, it's called "I am not a scholar of history because I seem to have forgotten mine." Brutus, past the realms of Gaul, beneath the sunset lies an island, surrounded by sea. Seek it, for there is your abode forever. There shall Troy be built again by your name, your sons. There shall your king born blood. Joffrey of Monmouth, History of Kings, Britain, circa 1136. They say Brutus walked across the Thames to find a forage spot for new London, Troy. But they say a lot of things. The world is flattened off and a lot smaller than we think. A forage spot is made from the forgotten lots of people misremembering. And we only forget when the last memory goes extinct. I think extinct is a nice word for exterminated. Things only fall apart when someone steals the screws. New Troy, New York, Troy is burning. Paris is on fire. The streets of Soho are less colorful. Palestine, Coptic, Syria, Egypt, pre-IR Iran are all hot because they are in the desert, but you cannot set them ablaze. And I am the artifact. And also the artifice of the contemporary, and I display little books upon the shelves, and the shelves become continuity, and none of my books are in Arabic and Coptic, and none of my dreams are my mother's, and none of the shelves are Egyptian, and all of these books are the canon, and Brutus walks across the river because he dreamt he should, and I buy an overpriced meal deal on the South Bank because the artist dreams of living in the heat of the culture, in the seat of the moment on the stage, not the audience, not the play, because who remembers the name of the woman who observed the first Spanish boat, or the child who watched the border drawn across his kitchen, or the monuments on the Nile, or the footsteps on the river or the buildings and not the bridges that burn down. London Bridge falls flat and I couldn't give a shit. Out of deliverance behind ancestry there are only roads that cut through. Before the M25 circled London and Ubers out of new Troy cost more than our monthly salaries, there were carriage roads and then natural tracks and then ancient Roman paths and then Brutus who never came to England and before that molten rock and a laundry pile and a pair of mismatched socks and my footsteps tracing his across Waterloo Bridge and before that desire my strong desire to not go extinct or cause anyone else to be exterminated. They say we can all find a forage spot, but they say a lot of things. Thank you. Cambridge! Give it up for Cambridge! So recently, I've been thinking about us. And I think we're in a bit of a pickle because you're the apple of my eye. The best thing since sliced bread. And when I met you, I was just grateful you gave me the time of day. And you didn't really talk much, but I didn't really care because kissing you was like having pop rocks in my lungs. We were like two peas in a pod. So you asking me on a date was just the icing on the cake because being with you was as easy as breathing. Although sometimes when I'm around you, it feels like I can't do both and the weeks might roll into one, but you still told me I looked radishing, like we were bagels. <laughs> but when I told you I loved you, I saw your eyes glaze over. When I wanted to talk, you'd clam up. You told me to stop whining. You told me not to bite the hand that feeds you. With you, I put all my eggs in one basket, but recently it feels like I've been walking on eggshells, and really, that's us in a nutshell. Me seeing feelings where there aren't any, and you knowing and eating my heart out anyway, selfishly. Like I'm nothing but a piece of meat, like your existence was dependent on my gratitude. You poured away pints of my life like they're replaceable and then took shots at me. I won't sugarcoat the way you rub salt in my wounds. Lately, it feels less like we fit together perfectly and more like you're forcing me to dance to your melody. I used to say you were an acquired taste. But recently, I just can't stomach you. And with me, you bit off more than you can chew. I deserve more than some half-baked love than the ice cream promises and sweet nothing platitudes, they drip off your tongue like acid. You became my everything, drinking wine when everyone else was drinking water. And I don't know if that made me your disciple, but I would have followed you to the ends of the earth. 
I was a shadow in your limelight, a puppet on strawberry laces, your entertainment. I became your nothing. It took a world between us to see that I didn't need you, that you're intoxicating but toxic. I used to think of you and my insides would curdle. These days, I'm moving on because I want to. Because there's no point crying over spilt milk. All you can do is extend an olive branch. Sometimes life gives you lemons. Just take them with a pinch of salt and an ounce of tequila. <laughs> anyway, it's just some food for thought. All right, Warwick, you ready? Yeah, let's give it up for Warwick, everybody. I am the umbrella, wasting away in this cupboard, but I am grateful and I don't complain. The flap of that moth's wing can be my wind. I can live through its discovery of these four walls. When my moth returns to ash, I'll let the dust that falls be my rain. I'll turn these hanging coats into my neighborhood and be okay with it. I'm okay with this. The cold has yet to come. Although I hear a pitter outside, I'm not excited. I know you ignore me in the autumn. You wiggle past grab a coat. I am okay with this. The rain has yet to come. So when the pitters turn patter and the winter arrives passionate, I dream of the cold droplets skiing down my frame. I'll inhale that breeze like a cigarette and she'll bring me some tranquility. So I'll stretch and then I'll dance and then you'll tug me back to shape. I have humiliated you, oh, here it comes. Now you're shaking me dry with aggression. Now we're brawling in the street as we always do. Don't you know you're embarrassing me too? Those human hands know nothing but colonization. I am destroyed before I have the chance to assimilate. Maybe it's a blessing that I break and lie mutilated in a street bin where I'll see my neighbors being loved, coats, being hugged, gloves, being warm, scarves, being kissed. I maintain gratitude for you, recycle, and the next year is yet to come. I will humiliate you amongst your neighbors. I will make you chase me when I waltz away. I remember to scream and wrestle and weep before I am tossed to swirl and spin and fly. I will discover a whole new land before I am caged. I remember to wait patiently for the rain. That day you most need me is the day my wrath will come. Thank you. Thank you, Warwick. Okay, everybody, pay attention. We've got four more poems in this slam, okay? And then we're gonna have our final feature poet, and then we're gonna hear the scores, and then there's gonna be great jubilance and noise and, and, and general reverie, and the night will be over. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to lock in. I want you to pay attention. I want you to prick your ears up even more than they've already been, because I know you've been giving so much love and care and attention, but there's always more in the tank, and whatever you've got, give it. Give it now, because this, this is it, and I say this all the time, and I know it's corny, right? And it's, you know, oh my God, be present. But, you know, like a lot of cliches, the truth is so easily said that it's eluding us, right? You know, like, be fucking present, be present. Right, be intentional about that. It's not just about the poem, it's about the way the light is hitting someone's cheekbones as they speak. The endearing way that their leg is kind of shaking because they're nervous, okay? How you can feel somebody else's arm on your arm as you're sat across from them. Okay, pay attention, okay? Be with it, be with each other, okay? This is it, we're not getting it again, all right? We don't get another go. Are you with me? Are you feeling it, yeah? All right. Birmingham, you ready? Yeah. 
Give it up for Burnley then. I don't get the, the Lucy lefty leg. Thank you. Thank you. Content warning. So this piece contains elements of civil war, refugee ship, and like parental pain. So if you need a minute to, I'll let you have that. My English is broken, she would say. My English is broken, my daughter. Until one day, one day she really told me she said, you think that their words of hatred can affect me, Ayane? Just because I don't speak the colonizer's language properly. Ayane, yes, mother, hear ho, your usheg. Tell them. Tell them that I come from a place where death was easy, where young people would greet the Grim Reaper before they got a chance to meet life's destiny. Tell them that my broken tongue, in fact, carries salams and battle scars from a people who treat their guests with the utmost respect, give them our best. Even the clothes off our chest, half whatever little we have with you. But you best pray to your Lord that we don't have war with you because Ayane, yes, mother, hear ho, your ushag. Tell them. Tell them that I've seen what war can do. And tell them that sometimes I feel as though that my people know how to die better than they know how to live. And that this isn't how it was meant to be. Nobody, nobody envisions themselves as a refugee. Somalia was more than enough for me, my daughter. But you tell them that they would need to know what I've escaped from to understand that broken English is the least of my worries. Because when I had to flee, I had to flee a place that was replaced with unmarked graves and bullets and bombs and tell them, tell them that sometimes I feel as though it's ghost was all we knew. And whenever struggle would visit us, we wouldn't shy away, we would welcome him into our homes. So girl, come in. So yes, my English may be broken, my daughter, but you tell them I am fluent in resilience, oh well. So who cares if I say Pepsi instead of Pepsi? <laughs> How dare they try to test me when the angel of death is still yet to get to me, Ayane? Yes, mother, hear ho, your ushag. Tell them, tell them. And has also, remember, remember to wear your Somali nimo with pride. When they ask you where you're from, you remind them that your skin is from a land that has been kissed by the sea and the sun and that your nose and your features are from a people who stick it high in pride and don't run when the arrow of pain hits and the angel of death hunts and that your lungs <sighs> breathe in sync to the heartbeat of a land where love and hatred mix. So a Karen trying to police our tongues is no match for us, Ayane, think. Think and tell them that revolution is as deep as the blood in your veins that remain unchanged like the river Shabel. And I heard a yes, mother, Ushega, Ushega. Tell them, tell them that they would need to know death as well as I do, for I have tried to flee through land and sea, and he has followed me, and those he took only remain in my memories. You tell them, my daughter, that they would need to know what I've escaped from to understand that broken English is the least of what gets to me. Tell them, Ushag. Thank you, Birmingham, Royal Holloway. Give it up for Royal Holloway. Content warning for vehicle crash and death in this piece. A boy I love asks me, hey, can you give me a lift? We step into the old Chevy and make silly faces our parents would be proud of. Hey, that's a shortcut. 
Like for your acrylic paint is the snow is bundled up, covering naked trees, building a setting of fog and frost, crystals parted from one another stare at me. The car in front doesn't slow down. The road is made of molten darkness, ice, rocks, and a mirror. All things in front of me seem clear, like they always do. And then, a deer. And in that exact moment, all of our windows splinter into a rainbow. I realize my grandmother had 14 words for the forest. I barely have three, and they burn my throat. Now we have hundreds of words for concrete, and a hundred more you could never write into this verse. And as the horizon shatters into a shimmer, I wish I had used up more pens, that I'd remember the smell of pine, that I would have taken a painting. And as the car splits clean into two from the middle, the deer stares at me, unmoving because this world belongs to her. We are its unwanted, indifferent trespassers. I lay in the field of fresh snow and branches, eyes glowing. She walks to me, lays her head beside my broken body, and whispers words no longer of this world. And I die as the snowflakes fall. Hey, can you pull over for a minute? That really scared me, I hear. And I still taste metal in my mouth. We continue driving and pass by two more, slowly this time. I roll down the window and I whisper my grandmother's words in the evening air as they look at me. Drive safe. My friend says, as I drop him off, and I decide quietly to only walk on moss and crushed leaves from now on. Thank you, Royal Holloway. Cambridge, you ready? All right, give it up for Cambridge. She holds her head high, barely 13, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. <laughs> and how she is adored, hands crawling up like ivy, she turns sunflower heads. It is the east. Juliet is the sun. See how she shines, golden breasts buffed by hands that grab, mold, pinch, hold. She holds her head high. Barely 13, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. It is your nature to perform. Her form is the playground of men and their wars. I've never seen anything so obscene masquerading as something so pure. Scraping fingers, flashing lights. Smile for the camera, dear. Did you not hear me? I said smile for the camera. Her gaze is vacant now, her best days far behind. A crack in the brass spreads through her chest, down her arm, ruptures her girlhood, fractures her innocence. To break is the most she is allowed to change. You see, the hands that formed her made her shine. The hands that wrote her made her rhyme. She thinks the hands that touch me are not mine. She does not recognize this tongue inside her mouth, how her tragedy was dictated, but I hear the Pope had her consecrated. <laughs> She's a site of pilgrimage, inspiring international crusade as men fight over her statue lips. They say she's got the sort of face that could launch a thousand ships and you can grab her tits for good luck. So you stand in line for this holy shrine, your hands to pilgrims, no to parasites. Is this how you were taught to pray? The queue creeps forward. She remains statue still, bearing her tragedy for our eager eyes to feast in fair Verona where we lay our scene. Hungry hands grope. She is barely 13.
Okay, our final poem of the slam final. Warwick, are you ready? Let's do it. Give it up for Warwick. I was once best friends with a ghost. And believe it or not, his name was Casper. <laughs> On Tuesday evenings, Casper and I would link up to play football on the east side, laughing and shouting as I expertly put the ball through his legs. I would turn with the grace of a figure skater who had been on ice since birth, shift the ball to the outside of my foot, strike hard on the point where leather meets stitching, Casper and I would stand and watch in awe as this leather swan soared with the majesty of a fighter jet. And when it finally nestled itself in the bottom left corner of our makeshift tea towel goalposts, I would scream, go. Now in hindsight, this wasn't that difficult. He was a ghost. Um, <laughs> sometimes Casper would bring along other ghost friends. Stephen would be dead by 17 to two cross-shaped stab wounds in his side. His left lung would betray him in an ocean of blood that looked more spilt ink than sacrifice. His mother would be in church that very Sunday asking Jesus why he turned her son's body into Judas and Marcus. Marcus would die a different kind of death. Life in prison. We practiced our kickoffs, never predicting that his would be the hands on the handle of the knife that took Stephen's life. Casper died at 21, a soldier lost to a war waged over an unfortunate glance, a chance meeting, wrong place, wrong time, this whole city is wrong. I ride my bike home through the east side of London and see dead people, boys and girls living on borrowed time like wind-up toy soldiers. Street signs has replaced the birthday slash that they'll break across their chest. Because when funerals become more frequent than birthday parties, the community cracks at the edges, heaves a sigh as though it heaving its last breath. And when there is no one left to mourn a dead black boy, or hold his hand as he heaves his last breath, or tell him that there is more to life than pain or anger, when there is no one left to mourn a dead black boy, was he born a ghost? I ride my bike home for this ghost town. The wind sweeps away the tears I forgot to shed at a thousand funerals. I ride my bike home till I get stopped by a group of boys. They ask me where I'm from, where I'm going. They ask me how I am still alive. I have no answer for them. I keep going. I make it through okay, I think. I can't tell because my hands keep passing through my handlebars. I sit and I cry and cry and cry. I mourn this life lived as a ghost. I mourn my own death before it ever even happens. That was Warwick, everybody make some noise. You did it, 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 you did it. Can we get, and I know you've given a lot, but I'm gonna ask you for some more because I know you got it. Can we get just one more big, huge round of applause and cheers for everybody in the grand final. That's for you. That's for you. Um, oh, I'm emotional, you know. That's beautiful. I hope that I hope you're really taking this in. Are you taking it in? Um, yeah. Ooh, beautiful. Um, Ooh, okay, so I can think of no better way to round off this evening before we find out the final scores to introduce a legend to this stage. Um, John, I haven't had the pleasure to meet you up until today, but you have been a presence in my poetry education 
as long as I've been literate. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody else read half cast in their GCSE syllabus. Um, yeah, and um, what I need us all to understand as, as people who maybe have only been reading poetry for a year, a few years, um, we stand on so many people and it's really easy to forget what's come before. We think we're the first person to invent something, do something, you know, we're gas, we think we're innovating. And, you know, of course, there are lots of amazing things that we're doing and pioneering as, as, as people coming up. But let me tell you something. The people before us were often doing everything that we're doing, um, but they were doing it without the internet to, to, to share their work and disseminate it to the public. Um, they were doing it with far more up against them, so much more resistance, so much more uh, confusion and disdain um, for the fact that they weren't speaking in the register that people think poetry should speak in. So I want to thank you, John, as someone who is one of the, the pioneers of British Caribbean poetry um, for setting a foundation for the rest of us to then thrive, to write. And I was rereading Half Cast and just thinking about the, 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 the music of it and how it spoke plainly to the people that would, would appreciate and understand and, and, and see themselves in it, but it did not compromise on, on the music. And poetry is music. Poetry is about how words rise and fall, um, how words meet a silence, or you know, how they undulate with your breath and your, your accent and all of these things. And I feel like you really spoke to poetry as music um, within your own tradition, within your own culture. You know, you and people like Jean Binter Breeze, uh, Linton Kwesi Johnson, Benjamin Zephaniah, who's no longer with us. Um, and if these names are not familiar to you, that's okay. We all learn things that are different times, but please look up these people. Like, we stand on their shoulders for real, okay? Um, if you want a poem to go out there into the public, you can Instagram it, you can YouTube it, you can do that, right? There was a time where if you weren't a white dude and you didn't go to Oxbridge or Russell Group Uni, good luck to you trying to get your poetry out there, seriously. And it was people like you that, that came up that really advocated for the, the beauty and the power and the, the, the relevance of the, the Caribbean poetic tradition. So thank you so much. It's an honor to have you here to bless us with your words. John Agard, everybody, please make some noise. Um, thank you, Vanessa, for your warm words and the energy you brought tonight, but also establishing a very important fact, continuity. Because you might think of someone like James Berry, who died in his 90s and did an early pioneering anthology. And I think I saw a Malaika Booker in the audience, and um, poets like uh, Grace Nichols, a number of poets. And of course, um, you might be a poet, maybe you might be a writer, but you need an editor, you need a publisher, you need an agent. So we should also pay homage to the organizers. You've got Melanie Abrams in the audience. And of course, um, uh, we take words for granted, imagining that tonight we are actually in communion. If we were at the cricket match, you'll need pads. You need your gloves. You go to a party, you probably got to have your music and your deck and your keyboards. All you've got in this room that's vibrating bodies into one and minds is the word. And this is why it is said that the first casualty of a war is language. You get euphemisms like limited collateral damage. I was asked to do three poems, and don't forget, sign language is choreographed language within a silent space. So I think you should give a big hand to your two signers. Um, the first poem, it's in the voice of a potato. <laughs> I was interested in this comment by A.A. A. Milner. What I say is, 
If a man really likes potatoes, he must be a pretty decent sort of fellow. <laughs> Call me Spud. <laughs> Tatty. Pratty. Fries. I am not fussed. In a womb of earth. I lie a curled up fetus, my flesh, my gift, whatever your color or status. And though I admit a potato a day may not like apple keep the doctor away, I stand here to say my peace, come what may. But before I, potato, unpeel my point of view, may I remind the citizens of the red, white, and blue of my abduction from my home ground, Peru. I, your humble, taken for granted tuba, whom you douse in ketchup, <laughs> salt, vinegar. I, who am both indigenous and uh, foreigner, now inseparable kin to your fish and chips, I who fill with warmth the freezing famish, well adapted to British kitchen and kinship. I'll gladly bear the brunt of whatever sin you lay at my wrinkled door. Like that famine, the root of Ireland's flesh and blood uprooting. But wasn't it your A.A. A. Milner, and I quote, who said any man who really likes potatoes must be a pretty decent sort of fellow? Sorry, folks, no disrespect, I assure you, to the creator of Cuddly Winnie the Pooh, but I have known potato lovers of fascist view, suckers for potatoes, fried, roasted, mashed, boiled, yet from closeness to the stranger. They recoil, preferring the stranger to elsewhere soil. Meanwhile, I'll be there for you, ever at your side, there, at home, on your plate, I'll reside, the edible prophet surveying all through blind eyes. Listen, Mr. Oxford Dunn. Listen, Mr. Oxford Dunn. Me not know Oxford Dunn. I didn't graduate. I immigrate. But I warn in you, Mr. Oxford Dunn, I'm a wanted man, and a wanted man is a dangerous weapon. I have no gun. I have no knife. But mugging the Queen's English is the story of my life. Yeah. I don't need no hammer to mash up your grammar. I don't need no axe to split up your syntax. I warning you, Mr. Oxford Dunn, I'm a man on the run. And a man on the run is a dangerous one. Them accuse me of assault on the Oxford Dictionary. Imagine a concise, 
peaceful man like me. Them want me serve time for inciting rhyme to riot, but are taking it quiet down here in Clapham Common. I telling you, Mr. Oxford Dunn, I am not a violent man. I only armed with human breath. And the human breath is a dangerous weapon. So make them send one big word after me. I ain't solving no jail sentence. A slashing suffix in self-defense. A bashing future with present tense. And if necessary, I'm making the Queen's English accessory to my offense. Because because I come from the West Indies, certain people in England seem to think I am an expert on palm trees. So not wanting to sever this link with my native roots, know what I mean, or disappoint any culture vulture, I just say to them, what is it you want to know? Which specimen you're interested in? Because you're talking to the right man. I name palm tree king. I know palm tree history, like the palm of my hand. <laughs> in fact, my navel string bury under a palm tree. If you think the queen could wave, you ain't seen nothing yet. Till you see the Roystonia regia, which she crung of leaves, waving calm, calm, calm over the blue Caribbean carpet. Nearly 100 feet of royal highness. But tell me what you want to know. How tall a palm tree does grow? What is the biggest coconut I ever see? What is the average length of a leaf? Don't expect me to be brief, because palm tree history is a long, long story. But why are you so interested in length and circumference? <laughs> that kind of talk so ordinary. That kind of talk don't touch the essence of palm tree mystery. That kind of talk don't challenge a palm tree historian like me. Why you don't ask me something with mathematical profundity? If an American tourist with a camera take nine minutes to climb a coconut tree, how long an English tourist without a camera will take to climb the same coconut tree? Uh, th that is problem, partner. That is problem, but now I come in harder. I come in harder. If six straw hat and half a dozen bikini multiply by the same number of coconut tree equal one postcard, how many square miles of straw hat you need to make a tourist industry? Find the solution and you got the revolution. Let me hear you, Cambridge, Royal Holloway. Birmingham, and of course, Warwick. Find the solution, and you got a revolution. One more hit me, one more time. Find the solution, and you got a revolution. Find the solution, and you got a revolution. But before you say anything, let I, Palm Tree King, give you this warning. I want the answer in metric. <laughs> it kind of rhyme with tropic. Besides, it sung more exotic. Thank you, audience. Thank you. Um, before you, diversity is. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. OK. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Good John walk away with the mic. <laughs> you say, I've done everything that needs to be done. It's his 
Um, can we make some more noise for the legend, John Agard, up in here? I know you were clenched. Oh my God, that was so funny. You were like, I thought we were done. <laughs> and now, <laughs> now we're being tested. Um, that was, oh, oh, I just feel so full, so satiated by what I've experienced tonight. Um, so they're totting up the final scores. Um, I'm gonna invite the director of Unislam, Toby Campion, to announce those in a moment. Um, but we've got to allow them time to tot those up first. Um, so. I'm going to read a poem for you all now. This is for, um, it's, it's not one of my own. Um, she's on hiatus, darling. Um, this is for uh, Boyega Urbanjo. Against resting in peace. There you go, telling me what to do still, like I ain't been here listening. I washed my ass, took my vitamin D. I voted, phoned my mum twice a week, bought my man outside the station hot drinks. I deleted social media, turned off the TV. I didn't, just read the headline. I didn't say anything. I knew it would harm my defence. I didn't go to bed, upset. I signed the petitions. I didn't cross the picket line, didn't walk under ladders. I texted you when I got home. I kept my hands where you could see them. I supported independent bookshops, dealers, the youth. I drank 14 units of alcohol a week, eight glasses of water a day, one glass of warm milk before bed. I fucking, I didn't expect you to say it back. I just said it because I meant it at the time. Honestly, I'm okay now. I'm six feet, 1.82 meters, two yards deep. And you still want me to listen. Peace, you say. How are we doing? We need some more time, are we good? Okay. All right, everybody. Um, I just wanna say that uh, this whole thing that we're involved in is a behemoth. Like, I don't think you can conceive of how much time and energy it takes to make something of this scale. And Toby, motherfucking campion, I know you see him, he'd be so like under the radar with it in his black beanie, in his, in his, in his all black outfit, like running around, but he's, he is the, the brains and the heart of this operation. He does so much to make Unislam a success every year and builds on it. This year, we have a therapist for the first time, like all these beautiful touches that make this not just an opportunity to come up and perform, but to be held, to be supported, to learn from each other, and to hopefully not just be better writers, but better kinder humans. Um, Toby, I adore you, you're amazing. Can we get a big, huge round of applause for Toby Campion. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, fucking hell, what a final. I, didn't, I wasn't here for many of the semi-finals, so I didn't really know what was coming. And I've been sat in my seat, like, welling up, laughing, staring at the wall, being like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> Turning to Alice, like, what is going on? This is, has been incredible. Congratulations to all of the teams. <laughs> You've done an amazing job. And to our incredible judges. Um, I know we're all chomping at the bit to get the scores, but I'm just going to say a few things before we announce that. Um, UniSlam is, tonight has been the culmination of an entire festival. There were 21 teams who registered this year who all worked just as hard as the four that you've seen on stage tonight. So can we hear it for all of the teams who took part? <laughs> UniSlam is not just the grand finals, it's preliminary rounds, it's the semi-finals, it's workshops, it's masterclasses, it's talks, it's open mics, it's a whole festival of events. Um, we're also home to the National Poetry Collective's Showcase. Yes! So we saw some of the top poetry collectives come together this afternoon and perform on the same, same stage, which is so rare. So can we hear it for all of the poetry collectives who perform tonight? We also support the Spoken Word and educate, Spoken Word Educators and Academic Researchers Network who do incredible things, so let's hear it for them, please. 
Um, we run programs throughout the year um, as well, support programs for uh, to engage young people with poetry and also for emerging artists and people beyond that stage. Um, so if you're interested in getting involved with the Uni-Slam or supporting our work, then please do get in touch with us after tonight. We would love to hear from you. Um, I also just want to say, uh, personally, a huge thank you to the teams for bringing your whole selves this weekend. I've sat and I've listened to, on the stage and off the stage, conversations about transphobia, the genocide in Gaza, and it just really struck me that the people here, the youth and the emerging artists, who are just so unafraid to talk about the things that we really need to be talking about. So I just want to say thank you to you all for sharing that with us. Really boring thing, um, we have some audience surveys. Um, and we would love it if you filled those out and also some participant surveys. They really help us uh, get funding, basically, uh, and support this to keep going every year. So please do fill those out afterwards. Um, you heard from our incredible um, individual poet winners. Let's hear it again. They performed at the start of the thing. <laughs> Kieran and Jesse. Every year, we also award a UniSlam Ambassadors Award. It used to be called Spirit of the Slam. It's now UniSlam Ambassadors Award. Um, and it's for a team or um, an individual poet or maybe a coach who um, really embody the spirit of UniSlam and are really here to support the community, um, facilitate, be here for people, um, and really bring forward the spirit of what this weekend is all about. Um, this year, we have awarded it to a person who has come back to UniSlam year after year after year to volunteer. Um, she hosted the preliminary three preliminary rounds, which is a really fucking hard job. It's very tiring. Um, and she's done amazing work. Um, so please give all of your love to the incredible Hannah Swings. I have lots of things that I want to say, and I'm not going to say them very well. And I've, I know you've listened to a lot of words being said the last few days. So I'm not going to use up too much of your time. I know you're desperate to know you lot who's going to win. Um, I just want to say, I came to UniSlam in 2018. When was it in Leicester? 2018. 2018, yeah. It's all a blur. Pre-pandemic is a blur. Um, and I just did not know what I was coming to. Um, I was a coach for Birmingham, and I did a coaches slam, and Alice was actually picked as one of the judges um, for that. And I did a poem about uh, called Spirit about um, me, uh, like a bit of a love poem about what my spirit animal kind of is and embodies and who the people are around me. And there is nothing more spirited in my life than uni slam. Um, and I come back every year, and I'm 31 now, and I have a toddler. And um, I like to come back and pretend that I'm 24 again, and that um, I get to the fact that I get to be a part of this even in a small capacity. It's just like the highlight of my year. And a lot of the roots of my professional life as a poet and as my personal life as a person um, come from this experience. So thank you so much for allowing me to have this award. I, oh my God, I'm so like emotional about it. Um, and also just enjoy every second of this. I hope you go home and like lie down and just think, oh my gosh, I experienced that because this is magical. And people out there don't realise what's going on in here. And um, we don't want them to because this is the magic that we want to <laughs> keep to ourselves. So thank you so much, everybody. And just enjoy um, the next half an hour, I guess, and afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, I'm going to announce the winners. Before I do, I'm going to say the time old maxim. The points are not the point. The point is the poetry. Thank you for all being here. Poetry Slam was actually started as a gimmick to get people to watch poetry. So thanks for being here. But ha ha ha, we tricked you all. <laughs> Silly, you're just watching poetry. So thank you for being here and supporting all of the poets. OK, I'm not going to drag it out any longer. Can I have a, a drum roll, please? Please give all of the love to all of the teams who I'm about to announce, the same level of love. OK. In fourth place, let's hear it for the University of Cambridge. <laughs> Cambridge, join us on stage. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. In 
third place. Let's hear it for Royal Holloway. out the way. In second place. Join us after the commercial break. No, don't be silly. Let's hear it, please, for the University of Birmingham. Which means, in first place, let's hear it for the University of Warwick! I'll be quick. Do you know what it is? <laughs> Can I just say, um, and I know my mom's rushing right now, so this is to her. But basically, growing up, she always said to me, my siblings, if you don't say, here I am, no one will say, there you are. Um, and you know what it is? Very frequently, does the world stop and ask people who look like us, who are you? What do you believe in? You know, what do you think about the world order? I feel like the beauty with poetry is that it allows anybody to speak, speak up, speak out, speak on the things that, you know, people don't see. Because ignorance really is a luxury, you know. Speaking about pretty flowers whilst there are, you know, airstrikes, that's a luxury, you know. And I'm just happy that you guys have provided your ears and your hearts to hear what we have to say, you know. Poetry is for us, it's for everybody. Um, and I'm so grateful for you for listening. I'm so grateful for my team. We are Warwick's first uni slam team. We are. We are. We are. No matter, no matter, no matter, no matter how we did in this festival, we've already made history, do you get? So I hope some kids years from now can know that like oh do you know what is check out this history do you get me yeah. right, then tell me that <laughs> thank you thank you thank you thank you let's hear for all of the teams that you've had tonight Big up Warwick, making history. Big up, big up, big up. Um, and before we all scatter and, and celebrate and, and, and gather in the pub, I just want to offer one more gesture of thanks to Toby for everything you do. Everyone say we love you, Toby. All right, bring it home. I love you too, thank you. That's, <laughs> that's so kind, wow, okay. Um, okay, I know we're all ready for a drink at the pub. Um, so we have some final thank yous to say. Uh, so if we can just get a low level rumbling and then some whoops and cheers after the names that I'm about to say. So thank you to all of the teams that have performed tonight and throughout the whole festival. <laughs> Thank you to our incredible, legendary judges, Nikita Gill, Caleb Femi, and the icon, John Acard. Thank you to all of our incredible volunteers and alumni. 
to our fantastic tech team here at the Hippodrome. Um, thank you to Maria Magdalena, Chris Subworth, and the rest of the incredible Hippodrome team. Um, thank you to all of our sponsors who I'm going to list. Arts Council England, Agilia, Apples and Snakes, Burning Eye Books, The Poetry School, Forward Foundation, and Renaissance One. Our tireless BSL interpreters for the evening, Rachel and Jacqueline. Um, the incredible team at Solihull College who have made the live stream happen seamlessly. Thank you to them. To our other um, tireless filmer, photographer, and just complete champion this weekend, Tyrone Lewis. <laughs> to my right-hand gal, Alice Gretton. <laughs> and our incredible um, social media person, Angela Innes. Um, our incredible audience online, thank you, thank you, thank you. Our incredible audience here. And last but not least, um, my gorgeous poetry wife, Vanessa Kasule. I think that is everyone. If I've missed you, I'm sorry, I love you. Thank you, we will see you next year. Have a great night, thank you. Ah!